A cold open question to kick us off for the Wednesday, July 10th edition of the Just Basketball Show. Wes Goldberg, free agency slowly trickling to an end here in the NBA. We've seen some movement, not a ton, but a lot of big names, a lot of famous players, if nothing else, who that change teams via trade, via signing, will be will take you the longest to get used to wearing that new jersey. What's going to be the weirdest opening night like eyebrow raise from the guys that that moved around here? Dan Thee Melton being in a Warriors jersey. I don't know that I'm ever going to get used to. I'm just kidding. No, it's it's the other guy. It's Clay Thompson being in a Dallas Mavericks jersey. He was seen uh, holding it up on Tuesday in the big Mavericks introductory press conference. He's wearing a new number which always makes the new jersey even more weird, right? It would be one thing if Clay was wearing number 11 in a Mavericks jersey, but he's not. He switched it to number 31 in a Mavericks jersey. So the guy's got new shout colors. Shout out Jason Terry. Yep, shout out to Jason Terry, I guess. Uh, nothing but bad memories <laughs> from my childhood about him, but whatever. Um, yeah, new number, new colors, new city. It's all weird. It's all weird with Clay Thompson. It's going to take me a minute to get used to that. It looks like a weird, like, trade gone wrong in NBA 2K. Paul George doing the same thing, right? He's changing to eight as he goes to Philly. That's going to be odd, yeah, for Kobe. And uh, considering that his literal nickname is revolves around a number that he's no longer going to be wearing, that one's a little tricky. The Sixers also wearing or or bringing back, it sounds like, the classic black AI era black with stars all that stuff i i'm i'm pretty psyched i may have to buy a joel and b jersey with with that design just because it's uh so iconic but let me see um the one that comes to mind is demar Derozan, but that's not going from one team to another i think it's just gonna be odd to i don't even mean this with hate but it's gonna sound like it just the idea going. of the kings yeah. getting a famous player just like the idea that the sacramento kings are a team that a player we all know went to and like signed with and then he's gonna be on the court it, there all of a sudden always, in october like i don't think i'll be used to it it's always weird seeing like a future hall of famer in a king's jersey again no shade but also you're the sacramento kings it was a little like Vince Carter at the end of his career playing for the Sacramento Kings. That might have been the last year mm. of his career, if I remember that right. Yeah. DeMar DeRozan is a much better player, a much better player now than Vince Carter was then at that stage of his career. So it's going to be even more weird. Let me ask you a follow-up. What's the weirdest mm. player in any jersey you've ever seen? Hmm. Like Michael Jordan on the Wizards kind of thing, you know? Yeah, Patrick Ewing... Hakeem Olajuwon, the the one that maybe because of well, there's two from a from just a, a local what I care about type of angle. The two kind of most iconic players in Suns history did not stick around on the Suns for their whole careers. They also didn't maybe make their names with the Suns either. But Charles Barkley going to the Rockets at the end, that one's always weird to me. Yeah. He tried to go ring chase with that group after they had made the finals when Jordan was out, and it did not go well, and he did not play great. And just something about Barkley and, and like bright red just didn't really work. <laughs> not not the most slimming for the end of a right. you know a guy known for being a little heavier's career. And then uh, Steve Nash in a Lakers jersey just scarred me. Yeah, just just terrible. Especially stuff. with the SI cover on that for me. Yeah, it'll always be Dwayne Wade in a Cavs jersey. The Bulls one was not as hard because the colors are similar enough to the Heat colors, but being in that yeah. nasty wine-colored Cavs jersey for Dwayne Wade, I was like, no, nah, that's that's that was weird. That was weird for me. Too far. Yeah, too far. All right, the Olympics are underway. The camps, at least, and not only do we have some group play and. NBA players across almost every single squad to look forward to, but we also have this scrimmage that is taking the basketball world by storm to react to, where Cooper Flagg looked like a man twice his own age against the best of the best of the best in Las Vegas. So we'll talk about which teams should tank for Cooper Flagg and our biggest questions heading into all of the Olympic exhibitions and everything else going on this month before they go to Paris. All coming up on today's Just Basketball Show. Oh, 
Welcome in to the Wednesday, July 10th edition of the Just Basketball Show. I'm Brendan Clean. That over there is Wes Goldberg. We are back. This is your three times a week dose of all things hoops. If you have not before, follow, rate, review, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're free and available everywhere, including YouTube. You can also catch us on social media, TikTok, Instagram, X, everywhere you are. We are pumping out content for you over there as well. Support for today's episode of the Just Basketball Show comes from BetMGM. If you haven't signed up yet for BetMGM, use the bonus code Just Basketball to get started, and you will get up to a fifteen hundred dollar first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's how it works: Step one: Download the BetMGM sportsbook app on iOS or Android and sign up using code Just Basketball. Step two: Deposit at least ten dollars and place your first wager on any game. Step three. Receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure to use the bonus code JUSTBASKETBALL when you sign up. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older to wager. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Wes. We got to clarify one thing before we dive into uh, a little bit of a debate over which teams should be tanking and which should not be tanking. The question that we have to settle first is what are we calling the sweepstakes here? Capture the flag is what I went with in our outline because it's the one that I've liked the best of what I've seen, but that's a low bar and I'm not in love with it. So maybe we can just try to settle and get it going here, whatever we think it should be. No way. All right. The other one I saw was sag for flag, and I that doesn't sound good. Capture the flag, I I would not only say it's the clear winner in the Cooper flag nicknames of the sweepstakes, it might be the best ever in for a name for a sweepstakes. Mm. I don't know that I've ever seen a better one. Capture the flag is perfect. Here, it says exactly what it needs to be. Here's the deal, though. Or the, here's the problem. It implies a sort of positive energy yes, that shouldn't true. be there. That's true. Capture, like, go get it. Go seize the opportunity, whereas really you're falling ass backwards into this is sort of, I mean, it does take some doing, like, as we'll talk about. It it is somewhat of an achievement to be this bad. You got to really want it. But it's not the spirit of, you know, what are the other ones that we've had in the past? What was the, what did we use for Vic and and, and Wembenyama? What was the... There was not a good one. Memorably, there was not a good one. His his name is too difficult. To me, the most famous one ever is Tank for Tua. That was a classic Mm. uh, in the NFL, Mm -hmm. obviously. Um, Easy. Like... I, was there one for Zion? I can't remember. Not trying for Zion is the best one that I can remember because technically his family and him, they say that's how you're supposed mm. to say his name. But okay, let's use let's use capture the flag. We'll deal with it for now. We'll treat it as an achievement because it sort of is. And I have it sorted as we're going to talk through these teams in tiers, basically. And it's funny, I was watching Around the Horn, Wes, uh, on ESPN right before we hit record because I have to for my day job, and Bill Barnwell, who covers the NFL but is on that show a lot, had the take right setting us up. I really wish we could just play his words uh, instead of our own here, and he said, NBA teams that are kind of in the middle ground should have been watching the scrimmage footage of Cooper yeah. Flag burying a pull-up three over Anthony Davis and driving to the basket around a screen and dispatching Drew Holiday, and they should be trading Lowry Markkinen, getting rid of their best guy, benching somebody, getting some you know fake injury reports drawn up. And that's basically what we're going to cook up here is this idea. But there's teams that I have as for sure tanking that we already know, teams that are probably tanking, teams that are maybe tanking, and then two wild card kind of maybe they'll surprise us and slip to the bottom of the standings on accident in a way that we can round out with. Well, so before we get to that, the, can we put a little yeah. bit more context on this whole Cooper flag mania thing? Because he's doing yes. the scrimmage with during the Team USA camp. It's the under select play, whatever they're called, the underage players, the select, the select team, team going up against the real one. And the real team had been blowing out the select team and the during they were allowed in, basically the entire 
uh, uh, that, that entire session was taken over by Cooper Flag. The select team was way behind. Cooper Flag scores 11 points in a flurry after that, including six points in like 20 seconds. There was a, a three point or a steal, a, a, a offensive rebound, and a putback with a foul. All these things. And it for, for, for Cooper Flag to time that out, I don't know if he did it on purpose, but to have it timed out perfectly for when the media was let in to that portion was exactly what he needed to get the Cooper Flag mania started here because now Oh wow. So this this to you was was premeditated. He was <laughs> he was half assing it until the guys got came in with the cameras and then he's he like all right. bagging a little bit. Here's my maybe moment. Maybe a little bit. No, I don't I don't know if it was exactly that strategic, but maybe he was energized okay. by it. I don't know what it was, but I it could not have happened at a better time for him. Right? And so it literally Well, this whole thing scrimmage. kind of couldn't have right. happened. I mean, like the Olympics by their very nature happen not whenever you want them to. The Olympics obviously only happen every 4 years, so there's <laughs> all these things about how he's the first college player to get even involved in this since yeah. I think like Marcus Smart did and obviously Anthony Davis did. I think there's one more I'm forgetting. And so to even have it all play out where this was an option and to do it in an Olympic year versus the select team for the World Cup year, which no one would even be paying any attention to, it's all just uh it's all just perfect. But the I mean, but that speaks to the crazy part of all of this, right? Which is that he not only is about to be in college, so really he's a high school player. But he also reclassified. So he is even younger. He'll be young for college this fall when he goes to Duke. So he's even younger than some of these other guys that that I just listed off that have gotten to participate in this in the past. Like he's doing this against guys that are significant, like beyond anybody he should be able to physically compete with, let alone actually like score on and defend and do everything he's doing. My favorite two sort of points of information on this is when he was born, LeBron James was going into his fourth NBA season. And if he were to qualify for the Team USA FIBA World Cup team, two years from now, he'll be 20 years old for that team. So he will still be by far the youngest yeah. player on that team, most likely. And he's already like five years younger than Anthony Edwards, who's the youngest player on the real Team USA team. So. Yeah, the, what he's doing and looks so mature and all these things. You get LeBron James giving him the butt tap and the dap at the end of the game. All these things. He's already getting respect. The, yep. the way that the team is talking about him, no fear, composure, all these things totally belies his age. And it's no wonder that yeah. the teams that you're about to talk about are all, uh, what, what do we decide? They're, uh, they're, they're trying to capture the flag. See, you're right. It doesn't work. They need to... It has to be more of a verb. It's not, yeah. It's not great. All right, we'll, we'll workshop that. But no, he'll turn 18 in December, and he'll turn 19 next December, the December of his rookie year. So he is about as young as you can possibly be in the NBA. You have to turn 19 by the end of the calendar year that you're drafted in, which will be next year for him. So uh, it, it really doesn't get much younger than he is as a draft player, let alone all this. Um, I I was gonna save it, but you're right. We 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 needed to set the stage for the flag mania in general. So I will give you. We're gonna sprinkle some takes throughout this episode to spruce things up, and one of mine relates to Cooper Flag as okay. a player. Do you want an air horn or something to to? And obviously, take? do I need a sound? Okay. Is that what you said? Sure. We got a take coming. Okay, beautiful. That's. <laughs> We need a sounder of you yeah, saying take, uh, that loaded into the board. Um, so basically, part of why, you know, let's say the quiet part out loud, part of why he's so interesting is he's a white American dude. And we've had endless conversations around Chet and before him, the lack of any of those types of guys is going to Duke, which of course just adds to the, 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 the conversation around him, the narrative around him, everything else. But even just aside from that, he's also an American, highly regarded, like generational prospect, which it has been a while since we have had one of these. Probably Zion would be the last. My take is I just like the international guys better at this mm. point. All the American players play the same exact way. You watch Cooper Flag, and you're like, yeah, this is Jason Tatum. 
He's on the select team. He's playing next to Brandon Miller. Pretty recognizable. Anthony Edwards. And there, you know, there's exceptions. Not every American player plays exactly the same. But the guys who have been at the top of their recruiting classes, the top of their AAU teams, these just kind of programmed basketball robot players. We've seen it before. And then... You watch some of these Euro guys or even some of the less highly regarded American dudes and it's just more fun. It's less predictable. It's more exciting. So I'm not trying to rain on the parade of flag. He's amazing. I'll talk all about how great he's going to be as we go through this. But I just have to like admit that following, you know, this draft sucks. So I'm not going to try to make the case of Zachary Risache or something. But watching Vic and charting his course or some of these other players, I'm like, it's just more fun. I, I like the development process and watching how these dudes adapt to the league much, much more than these pull up three switching on deep. Like it's I'm over it. I'm over <laughs> the American, the American prodigy. Look, I'm with you. And by the way, drag for flag. Okay. Right. Okay. I can get behind it. I'm not thrilled, but maybe, maybe it'll, maybe it'll uh, grow right. on me. So if you're dragging for flag, um, no, I, I agree with what you're, and I've actually had this thought too, when I was watching my Florida Panthers go on their Stanley cup run, what was so interesting to me, especially in the Stanley cup final against Edmonton and how amazing and, and legitimately terrifying Connor McDavid was without having to score, but he creates so much for his teammates. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is such a European thing, right? Where you literally get points in hockey, which is essentially a Canadian sport. You get points in hockey for assists the same way you get points for goals, right? And they don't call it assists and they don't call it goals. You just get you get a certain amount of points. And Connor McDavid broke the Wayne Gretzky annual memorial record of points in a playoff or whatever it was and ended up winning a thing. So mm-hmm. uh, he – but it was just points. They said this guy was this dominant. He had this many points. And the points come from assists and goals scored. And we don't have that in America. That's a very European sensibility. It's the assist is just as worthwhile as you scoring the points, as you scoring the goal, making the basket, whatever it might be. And we don't have that in America. It's in AAU, hey, are you a 20-point-per-game scorer or are you not? And if you are, you're going to get on the best AAU circuits, the best teams with the best shoe deals. You're going to get on the Nike one or the Adidas one. You're going to play in the McDonald's All-American game because you score 20 points per game in high school. And it doesn't really matter what else you do. And that is a very specific to America type thing because you look in Serbia, Slovenia, Italy, Spain, the way that these people are playing and wherever else, the way that these people overseas are playing basketball, there is an emphasis on the past. It's an emphasis on teamwork just as much as like you see a guy like Nikola Jokic and even Luka Doncic who might be a little bit more isolation heavy, but his, he generates more three pointers than anybody else does in the league. Like he's still an offense unto himself because of his ability to pass the ball. And he's a genius-level passer. I don't know that the American players have that. Even the worst players, though, right? Like, let's not even sure. go to the MVP-level yeah. guys, but it's like Alper and right. Shengun or, like, some of these random guys who will just come, like, uh, Vasilya Mitsich, the dude that the Thunder had who they traded to Charlotte. Like, he's fun. Or Compazzo who came through. Like, okay, they're not, they're not going to win titles. I understand I'm reaching pretty deep there, but, like, stylistically it just feels like such such a breath of fresh air in a way that even the amazing talent that somebody like flag has just doesn't feel exciting right now in europe alper and sangoon all these guys coming over from france all these guys they didn't care about michael jordan they didn't care about kobe bryant the way that american kids did do right And do you remember one pass that Kobe made? No, you don't remember any of his passes. You don't remember a single pass that Michael Jordan made other than the one. I remember the pass off the backboard to himself. (laughs) That's what I remember Kobe's passes. How's this for passing the ball? Um, It it was just amazing artistry and shot shot making that made them stand out. And that's what plays on the YouTube. There's, I guarantee you, not a single YouTube uh, compilation as the billions of Kobe Bryant was a pro like scoring all these things, the YouTube compilations you have of him. I promise you there's not one of them about Kobe Bryant underrated passer exclamation point. Like that's not a YouTube compilation, you know, it doesn't work. So I, 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 you look at the European players and the players that they grew up watching 
are frankly a lot of players we never even heard of. But even if it was like a Sabonis or something like that, sure. that that still was a big deal for them. So I I hear everything you're saying, but to bring it back to Cooper Flag, I think the part that makes his game very refreshing yeah. is that he's not exactly like that. I mean, the dude could score. There's no doubt about it. But he's got a measured game. He does all the yeah. little things. He's kind of like a a high level util, utility player where he does the rebounding, the passing, yeah. the plays defense, guards multiple positions. There's a selflessness that, about him. There's there's a composure about him. There's not like this, oh look at me, I'm doing all this stuff, like all the scoring. I, he doesn't strike me as a young player who grew up he watching almost plays. He almost plays like. Tatum right, plays exactly. now, if that makes sense. Where not how Tatum played at Duke, where he was like a Carmelo clone, but more the do it all team guy version of Tatum. And that's why I think the comp actually people are making it so much it is because we're watching Tatum dominate doing that. But if you think of what Tatum was, he was in the Jabari Parker, you know. Carmelo kind of mold. So yeah, I think early on in Flag's career, he'll be an off ball player on the offensive end. So he's it's it's not a one to one. And and right now the defense is the special part of his game. But let's yes. get to his his I don't know how much we'll even talk about his fit, but it, it maybe it'll factor into whether we think these teams should should go for it or not. But let's start with for sure tankers and the Washington Wizards, I think, lead us off west because even if they didn't want to tank they're going to be tanking. They're going to be awful. They drafted a player in Alex Sar who is a project won't won't help them win games this year in all likelihood. Their their first round pick last year, Bilal Koulibaly, also not ready to take a step forward enough to add wins and they have Kuzma and Poole who were pretty negative players last year. So they're going to be in the mix. Uh, what are we doing? Dragging for flag? They're going to be dragging for flag. For sure. Uh, the Wizards, they ne- they didn't necessarily time out their tanking at the right time because they really tanked for this draft where they ended up with the number two pick in Alexar. But luckily for them, they still stink. So they'll pro- they're going to be in the mix for Cooper flag and, yeah. and whoever else is at the top of this draft as well. The other team is the Brooklyn Nets, and I think that's what they did so smartly. And and here's my take. You mentioned that we're going to be sprinkling in some takes. Here we go. When we look back on this summer, we might look at Brooklyn as having the best offseason out of any team, and that includes the Philadelphia 76ers who added Paul George and the Oklahoma City Thunder who crushed all of their homework assignments. Because if by by trading their Houston picks out and getting their own picks back or the Phoenix picks, you know what I mean? Back to Houston and getting their own picks back. They opened the floodgates for them to tank on their own. They control their own destiny as in terms of getting the best possible position in the top four of the lottery. And then, you know, the lottery gods do what they will. Yeah. But that was a stroke of genius by them. And they said, you know what? Mikal Bridges, everybody wants him. We got five first-round picks for him, and then we negotiate all these other things to try to get ourselves in position. Now we're in control of our own destiny. Now we're in control of our own tank. And guess what? We are going to be so bad. Like, we are at, we are going to be so bad. And some of their best players on the roster could still get yeah. traded, right? They could still trade Dorian Finney-Smith, Cam Johnson, Cam Thomas, whatever. They could still trade these guys, right? Nick Claxton is not going to win and yep. win them enough ball games. So... I, I think what they did was a stroke of genius. I thought it was extremely forward-looking. I think it it brought everything that they needed to control back under their own grip. And if they do this drag for flag correctly and they get a little lucky in the lottery and end up with the number one pick, we could end up looking back years from now and being like, yeah, that was a cool couple-year run for the Sixers. And you know what? The Thunder were awesome, but they were already awesome. And the Hartenstein and Caruso maybe things didn't necessarily result in a championship. Like if those things don't result in championships, but the Nets end up with Cooper flag, it'll be the Nets who walk away with the best off season, not the teams that we're currently talking about the most. Absolutely. I I was going to add the only thing that would make it better is if they are able to trade Finney Smith and Johnson and get even worse and get more assets because I think they can. I'm surprised they haven't yet. It feels like some other shoe has to drop, I guess, before that well, stuff now that gets Haywood cleared away. Signed, but I think um, he's there. <laughs> the last domino to fall. Yeah, it'll all start to clean itself up. Yeah. Uh, all right. So those are for sure. 
And you can tell me if I'm wrong as we move to our next category, if there should be more than two for sure tankers, but we're going to already move, uh, move to our probably category where I have the Portland Trailblazers. They should be in the for sure. The okay, reason I don't why. have them... Yeah. Well, right now they still have Jeremy Grant and DeAndre Ayton on their roster. Not that those guys are huge positives, but they are veterans who prevent you from being awful, even if they don't make you good. Like, they're better than Kuzma and Poole, I would say. Wow. Um, and I don't know if the Blazers want to continue to be terrible is part of the other thing. They have kind of the pieces you would hope would be the next good foundation in Portland. They have that. So do they want to be the worst of the worst? Will they be resting players? Will they, they be doing all those sorts of things? They're also going to start the season with Robert Williams and Malcolm Brogdon still on the roster on top of uh, the other guys that I already mentioned. So they're kind of too veteran heavy and wanting to take a step forward than some of these other, like the Nets and so the Wizards. So not remembered because it happened so early, but Malcolm Brogdon get, did get traded to Washington. But they did add Danny Avdia in that deal, who is a better player and a good fit for them. DeAndre Ayton, La- oh, we're going, okay. They had Jeremy Grant and DeAndre Ayton... St- last year and they won 21 games so unless they get internal improvement from scoot and if denny obvia does come in and take sort of that another that next leap that i think obvia fans anticipate him taking maybe they could be a little bit better but the west is brutal i i would still put that i i still think they stink man i would probably put them in the for sure thing even if they do want to win games it kind of feels like it's gonna be really hard to do um me they're probably not i guess to your point you can almost put them in the middle of like the Nets and Wizards who are sort of out there unapologetically dragging for flag, where the Blazers are at least kind of putting like a smiley face sticker over it and, they, and kind of saying things like, no, we have our star of the future and blah, 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 where those other, like the Wizards and Nets are clearly not saying yeah. that. But I would think, I, I would still, if it was on the spectrum of for sure and probably, I think I would move them more towards the for sure thing. Okay, yes, I absolutely did forget Brogdon got traded for Obdia, so let's uh, uh, clean that up for sure. Um, I, I I hear you, and, and they were bad again. Shaden Sharp also missed a yep. ton of time, and Scoot was terrible. So I just, I don't know. I, I think they don't want it badly enough, so it would have to just be that a lot of things go wrong. And so that's why I have them as probably versus for sure. The other team in here is Toronto. And they're kind of in the same boat where I don't really think they want to be terrible and they already have a player that they just paid in Scotty Barnes like he should be one of the foundational pieces for a good Rocket, a good Raptors team. Not a bad one. So that plus quickly got a new contract and they make these trades all the time to get veterans in the ha- in the door like Olenek and Pirtle. So the Gary Trent thing's still sitting there, but he can obviously score and, and provide some spacing. They have players from the past couple drafts that they're going to want to develop alongside Scotty. Like that would be another one where I have them in probably because I don't really buy that that whole agglomeration of players is actually going to be good, but I don't think that they're trying. I don't think they're going into October saying we want the number one overall pick. So you think the Raptors will be worse than Detroit and Charlotte next season? I, I don't know, but I think... Detroit and Charlotte have even more of an impetus to be getting out of the muck. Whereas the Raptors, to me, we just saw them get rid of Ananobi and Siakam. So in theory, they are kind of at the beginning of a rebuild, even if they also have some of that other stuff that makes it hard to read, get a read on what they're doing. But, I mean, in theory, right, you tear down at the deadline the next season— Typically, you want to get a top pick and see where that takes you. So, like, that's kind of where they are in their life cycle, whereas the Pistons and Hornets have already done that. Yeah, I just, I I worry if I'm Toronto that Scotty Barnes is already too good to let me get to Nets Wizards level of tanking. And I know I know that's why you have them at so, a different tier, but... Yeah, well, so do you think Scotty is better in terms of, like, raising the floor of a team than Cade or LaMelo? Because that's kind of the, that would be the difference, right? I guess there's a, a couple other things too with those teams. I think that the Hornets just have a better roster than Toronto. Uh, that so that's mm-hmm. part of it. Um, Detroit they don't even own their 2025 pick. That's owed to the Knicks, and it's top 13 protected. Yeah. So they could like there's yep. a reason for them to to tank because it's top 13 protected. 
Um, so I'm wondering if Detroit tries to actually go the other way and say, all right, like this is supposed to be a loaded draft. Let's be bad one more year because if they are, if they, if they do keep the pick and it's top 13 protected, then it gets kicked into the next year and it's top 11 protected. But how many more 16th draft pick type players does Detroit really need? If they were to, you know what I mean? Like, so I agree. I I think what you're saying is, is right that maybe they either, they got to either take a better, get get higher than that. But if they lost the pick, like, okay. I think that's worth it. Right. At this if you point lose the pick, they, it they means just had that a Cade season Cunningham's from hell. Awesome. And some of these other players developed, right? Yeah. But th- we, let's remember, too, we got a new GM there, right? He's not under any rush. Mm-hmm. He's like, I just got here, man. I, was like, I didn't take Cade. I didn't take Asar Thompson. I didn't take any of these guys. Like, I'm just getting started. And so he might say, I have the appetite for one more year of being really bad, especially if it means I can get somebody like Cooper Flagg, who's this sort of generational prize talent at number one. Uh, so I think I'm, I would maybe move the Pistons further into the probably tier just because I do think there might be an appetite to be bad one more year, even if the fans don't want it. And Well, look, their roster also doesn't fit very <laughs> right. well together. In term, well, their young core doesn't fit very well together. And you could easily see Detroit being a team where if it gets toward the end of the year, like does Tobias Harris have a hamstring issue? Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they they kind of feel like a, a candidate for for some of that and they you know they they have like if if Jaden Ivy wasn't on the roster by the end of the season would that would that shock you I mean it, you know they're 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 in flux so okay, let, okay. let's move the Pistons we, we can this will be a living like breathing this. document uh, as we as we go here the Pistons are in the probably category okay. let's move to maybe I think you and I are in agreement yep. on Charlotte they're they're a maybe only if they have another, you know, if Mark Williams and LaMelo continue to, to deal with injuries, if Brandon Miller doesn't take another step forward from a promising rookie season, if, you know, Miles Bridges falls off a cliff, I don't really see why that would happen. But they have a, a core of guys, and they have a real bench now with all these different vets that they've brought in through these we'll take your picks for your bloated salary types of moves they have a grant williams and a uh uh josh green and some of these players now where like even their bench isn't going to be terrible so i have just a hard time imagining unless it's injury related that the pit that the hornets are are awful i like their new coach Um, i like charles lee i think brandon miller will take a leap i really liked his rookie year Lamelo will be better and probably be healthier and I think Mark Williams will be better uh, going into the third, fourth year, whatever this is, third year. So, yeah. Just a, a, a sicko thing to watch for with Charlotte. I think Amari Bailey is a really good player, and he didn't play much last year, but okay. uh, I like him. All right, Spurs. Yep. Are they are they too close to the top of the dragging for flag sweepstakes? Are, is this just going to feel ridiculous in... 20 games into the season when Vic is looking like an all NBA guy and they're just going to be impossible for them to be this bad. I kind of go back and forth on this because I do like their moves, right? Adding Chris Paul, adding Harrison Barnes. You obviously have Victor Webinyama. The shape of what you want to be around Victor Webinyama now is there, right? It makes sense. They spent his rookie year trying to figure it out. Now they're kind of building the team that you need to build around him. They also have four first round picks in this draft, their own, they have one coming over from Atlanta, which, what a disaster. Uh, they still have, they have one coming over from Charlotte, which is interesting. That's protected for one through 14. Yeah. So kind of going back to your Hornets point, maybe a little bit more of a reason for them to be bad is to keep that pick. Uh, because if it's not conveyed, then it becomes a second round pick. So a big reason for Charlotte to be bad, yep. right? Because now you're not losing this first round pick yep. or any first round pick. So that's part of it. And then you also have a first round pick com- coming over for shock, uh, from Chicago that's top 10 protected. That one can kind of go either way. But um, yeah, I don't know what the Spurs, the, the, what, the problem is that the West is really hard. If they were in the East, I, would, I might pick them to be a play-in team. But in the West, it's just so much more difficult. So I don't know where to go with them. I don't know either, and we'll have to see it, right? I mean, I think a lot of it is still how good is their young talent going to be? How how much will it fit together? You know, Chris Paul is going to help. I think even Harrison Barnes, just by being better than 
the other players they were trotting out there last year will be right. helpful too. But at the end of the day, you look at their rotation right now. If you assume CP and Barnes are starting, you're, they're, they're probably going to start Vic, those two, Vassell, and pick whoever else you like, Sohan or, or something like that. So Sohan's a big question mark. Vassell is not like some extraordinarily positive player yet. Keldon Johnson off the bench. And then you're getting to a lot of these question mark guys. Um, and that could be another bad team. Is, is, but I also think we should make a distinction. Sorry, is Chris Paul and Harrison Barnes, like the additions of them, because that's really the only things that changed. And then I guess would be the second year of Webanyama. Is that enough to go from 22 wins yeah. to 42 wins? Which... Well, no, but that's exactly that was that's the distinction right. I was just going to say, and it, it's it's the same thing with like the pick the protected picks that you've brought up a couple times already with uh, the Hornets one you just mentioned, and then uh, the Pistons and whatever is these teams all of them will be bad. We're, all these teams will probably be right. in the lottery, right? But that's what I was kind of speaking to of like maybe this is a little bit of an achievement, and it is kind of capturing the flag because you have to be determined to be as bad as you need to be, even with the flattened lottery odds, to get into the top four and have the best chance of getting to number one. The four worst teams in the NBA are god-awful every year. So I don't think the the Pistons will be god-awful, worst four teams in the league. I don't think the Spurs will be. But they're going to be bad. I don't think that the either of these those teams are making the right. playoffs, right? So like that's kind of where we are but it's like do you have the do you have the gall and do you have the the lack of talent to actually like really yeah. suck that that's yeah, what we're I, talking I, about here everybody loves the spurs like we're all officially in the nba media verse on the spurs bandwagon and i get that it reminds me a little bit of the houston yeah. rockets last year of hey like don't don't sleep on the rockets they might make the playoffs <laughs> and for their credit they almost did make the play in tournament but it took a really strong second half push for them to do that. We're usually a year early on this stuff. We're usually a year early on this stuff. Yeah. I'm not going to discount Victor Webinyama, but people that are out there saying be like, don't count the Spurs out. This could be a playoff team. I, I feel like I'm not that high on this team. I like it. I'm gonna really enjoy watching them on League Pass, but I'm not picking I, I don't know that I would put money on them making the playoffs either. Okay, so we have Hornets and Spurs. We'll keep them both okay. in maybe. Jazz. Yeah, this one's a little bit more complicated. If they right. trade Markinen, if if they trade Markinen, they're, they're going to be a straight terrible to the for sure tier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll go to the top, and they would be you know put some money down on them getting the number one overall pick early because you do it now because they if they trade Markinen, the odds will be even better. But like, I don't know if they will. I th- wouldn't have, wouldn't it have happened already if it was going to the Larry Markinen trade. There's, there's a bunch of stuff out there yeah. about, hey, teams actually want him to sign the extension before he gets traded, but then if he signs it, he can only sign it on August 6th, and that means that he can only get traded on February 6th, yeah. which is a day before the trade deadline or whatever it is, and all this like crazy- Yeah, it'll, he'll have right. one day where he's legally allowed to be traded if he signs that extension, which is the deadline right. day so next year. All that stuff is really wild. I also don't know how much I buy that. like I understand it, but also if he signs the extension- the Jazz might just keep him, and I would imagine if he signs the extension, he probably wants to stay in Utah. And also, if he signs the extension, that becomes doesn't that become a poison pill contract at that point, which becomes a lot harder to trade for? I think I have that right. Where right now, he's making $18 million. That's way easier for a lot more teams to trade for. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe the Jazz are hemming and hawing a little bit. The one thing I do know is Danny Ainge does tend to take his time with this stuff, and it would not shock me at, at all. Uh, the Jazz will reportedly take meetings in Las Vegas during Summer League about Larry Markkinen. It wouldn't surprise me if we had like a Paul George, Kawhi Leonard earthquake night with not quite to that degree or magnitude, I should say, which would have been a way better way to yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, having a, a Larry Markkinen <laughs> deal go down while we're in Las Vegas. So I'm, I, I think it could go either way I at mean, this point. Ainge wants a summer of Steph Curry at Team USA camps talking about how sad it was that clay has right. gone and how hopeful he is that they can win a champion, compete for a championship again and how it's great to be around great players in Team USA camp and all, you know, 
they're willing to wait because what what hurry do they have? So yeah, I I, I don't think it's a sure thing that Markkinen is just going to stay because after a week of free agency, he hasn't left. Uh, but he also could just stick around and he'll also, be on a good don't value deal. The fact that we we have setting the the poison we have stuff three aside. months between now and the start of the season. We have a month between now and yep. when Larry needs to sign that extension. And sometimes front offices just talk themselves into stuff. Like they just, they're sitting around for agencies over summer league is kind of dragging on. Everybody gets bored and you sort of talk yourself into a jazz Larry marketing deal. Like I wouldn't discount that not to just keep reading like the, the real GM page of the picks that these teams have, but I'm going to do that anyway with the jazz. If they do trade marketing, I think they're going to be looking for a prize pick in 2025 or potentially 2026. They have two first round picks, potentially three in the 2025 draft. They have their own, which is owed to Oklahoma City, but it's protected for the top 10 picks. So a little bit more incentive, right, for them to tank is to keep that pick. And that that of the three picks that they could have here has the best chance of actually getting Cooper Flag because the other two picks are from Cleveland, unprotected, and from Minnesota, unprotected. Those teams are going to be good, right? Those are not Cooper Flag teams. So if you do trade Lowry, maybe you're looking for a little bit more of that prized 2025 unprotected first-round pick, but... I also would be really surprised at this stage if, especially after what we just saw, even the dumbest front offices that had no idea who Cooper Flag was, were going to trade an unprotected first round pick in 2025 at this point, especially if you're going to be projected to be that bad. Okay, so should, with all that said, we move Lowry, or should we move the Jazz to the probably because we feel like the marketing and trade could still happen? And then if if it does, like, then I'm going to put really them in bad. probably just because I don't think they're that good in the first place anyway. Right. I, I like look. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were they've been a lottery team the past two years, even with him having this breakout. So uh, maybe that's right. OK. Hawks, I have in maybe and that's sort of just like they're kind of in a similar spot as the Nets. They're not going to get rid of Trey, which creates somewhat of a floor. But even beyond that, there is all this. They're going to try to move DeAndre Hunter. His name has not been in one thing I've read this summer. Um, you know, Capella, there was whispers like pre-draft and now he's still on the team. So if they really tore down more beyond DeJounte and it was like Trey and a whole bunch of young guys, then I could see them being bad enough to be in the mix even with Trey. But until that happens, they're still rolling out a starting lineup that's not crazy yeah. different from last year or the year before, in all honesty. So I don't think they're going to be terrible unless they make some more Biggest moves. Biggest swing factor for uh, the Hawks, That's it for Jalen maybe. Johnson coming back. Except, he was awesome okay. when he played last year. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, that's going to help them. So somewhat interestingly with him, believe he's, he is, uh, extension eligible, like a lot of these guys we've seen, and they don't seem to be doing the Mm. Franz Wagner with this and they're, they might not give him a no brainer max right now. And they might take it to next summer or they might agree on an extension pre October deadline. That's a little less than that, which is what a lot of people have been clamoring for some of these teams to do with these less proven players. And Maybe they're going to be the ones to do it. Okay. Uh, last maybe team is the Bulls. Very brief take here if you want to give me the sound. All hope is not lost with Zach Levine. Okay. That's where I'm at with this one. Not enough to... I mean, they're here. I put them on maybe to set us up for the to the, for the walkthrough on, on, on capturing the flag. So I'm not saying he's a number one on a great team. But I think part of them being awful would have to be at some point during the season trading him and replacing him with, you know, even worse young players and and that type of thing. And I understand why they weren't able to trade him this offseason. His value literally couldn't be worse. He has a bunch of time and money left on his contract. He played a grand total of 25 games last year. Did not look like himself. And the team has been a mess. But he's 28 years old. This is a guy who has averaged 27 points per game in the NBA, averaged 24 plus in three other seasons, even if you want to set the super outlier one aside. He is a knockdown three-point shooter, and he's never really been on a team where his weaknesses are able to be minimized since he entered his prime. So I just want to be on the record basically saying that Zach Levine on a good team with better defensive talent, if that opportunity ever arose for him, like we saw, frankly, speaking of the Olympics in Tokyo in 2021, I think he can be part of a good team. I think he has enough 
positive things about him and his contract is not as onerous as some of the others we see, that uh, he could still have one last word in the NBA. We shouldn't bury him yet. Is I'm with fair? you on this. I think we've gone too far in the Zach Levine as a, just a bad player or maybe, I don't think anybody says that, but like a losing basketball player. He's kind of been labeled that way, the way that yeah. guys like D'Angelo Russell kind of carry that label and, and, and things like that. I'm not there with him. I've always liked Zach Levine a little bit more maybe than consensus even. Three-level scorer. You mentioned the knockdown three-point shooting. He, can, he gets to the rim plenty. Um, yeah, if you can shoot threes at a high volume and get to the rim and finish, like, how, we're really going to call you the bad? is that... It's the problem is the injury concerns, and the contract is pretty bad. It's just it's 150 million dollars owed over the next three years or whatever it is. And um, in a new CBA, like I don't think this, tri- I don't think his deal would have been that hard to move two or three years ago. But in a new CBA where you basically only get to have two max players, players making that much money, nobody wants to have it. One of those two players be Zach Levine because I think he's good, but he's not that good. And and I think that's the hard that's that's yeah. the reason they're having a hard time trading him more than anything. In terms of the Bulls being good, yeah. to your point, like he's never been part of a good team that covers up his weaknesses. That includes this year's Bulls team. They don't cover up his weaknesses. They're going to be god awful defensively. Exactly. Um, I he's going to be for them this year what Kuzma and Poole were for the Wizards yes. last year, where it's like he has no incentive to do anything but just chuck shots and kind of right. like And fuck for a team that kind you know? of has made it very clear that, that they don't want him. So it'll be interesting to see how he responds to that emotionally and, and how that affects him on the court. I would probably put... Okay, they should be higher. I they should be in probably. They're pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Which, good for them. Yeah. And I'm looking Finally. at the roster again, and, They've and been I'm kind of like, yeah, every, I don't, I don't think year. so. Congrats, Bulls fans. Yeah. You went yeah. to probably. And, not quite for sure, but still probably. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Zach Levine, 31% of the cap this year, 30% next year, and then the player option, 29%. It is egregious. It is an onerous contract, but um, it he has more value on the court than a lot of other players that we think of that way Correct. is maybe the best way to put it. All right. Surprise. Could they maybe tank? And this is trolling you a little bit, but let's just start with yeah, it. The Miami cool. Heat. Uh, it would be surprising. I think it's the right way to put this tier because this is a playing tournament two years in a row now. They had have had a pretty serious attrition of players who were important to them. Uh, Gabe Vincent, Max Drews last summer, Caleb Martin obviously this summer. They have basically backfilled those guys with good draft picks. Jaime Hakez, Nikola Jovic, Khalil Ware seems to be. Yeah. Uh, he, he's doing well in summer league so far and might be able to play a role for them this year. You get a more engaged regular season version of Jimmy Butler in what amounts to a contract year. Maybe this team can surprise people in the other way and actually be back to being a top six seed in the East. But you know what? This team has made a habit of getting hurt, not taking the regular season seriously. At least their star player hasn't. And, um, you know, I think their defense was a little bit... It wasn't as elite as their top five defensive rating last year might lead you to suggest. They had a really hard time playing good teams. They were like 1-11 against the last 12 top 10 teams they played last regular season. A lot of that, again, has to do with injury, but some of it isn't always injury either. So this team can go either way. And then the big one, too, is, well, if Jimmy Butler is going to opt out next year, teams generally don't like their stars walking away for nothing. If things go south the first couple of months of the season— they're not exploring Jimmy Butler trades now, but if they're like eight games under 500, exactly. could they explore it in January? That's the case, right? I mean, also, just to take a necessary shot, you don't let your star players walk unless you're the Los Angeles Clippers, in which case you just kind of do it for no real reason. Um, Butler either, well, and or, I guess I should say, it could be both, getting hurt, and or getting traded would be the mm-hmm. beginning of the case for a uh, potential bottoming out. And both of those things are very much on the table. Hero, is he a player that makes you win more games if he's playing a lot? I, I think the, the jury is still somewhat out. Terry Rozier, also an injury risk based on last year, not really before that. So I don't want to, you know, assume that's going to happen, but could. He, he didn't really contribute much after he got to Miami. And then beyond that, it's like if the top of the roster is not great or not available from an offensive standpoint, and you're talking about Bam and a bunch of shooters and kids, 
it's like that's not a very high level team and you could easily talk me into that team being you know getting like the seventh or eighth best odds in in the lottery and you know, we've seen those teams jump up I don't think they're bad enough that any version of this team given that under Spo and especially given that Bam is a just a freaking machine I don't see a right. floor just falling out where they're like the second worst team in the league by the end like that would just be kind of inconceivable but if you told me they were a lottery team and then kind of turned the dial back in March and April maybe including a Butler trade and that got them from 13th to 8th in the lottery like I don't think it's that inconceivable given where they've been the past couple of years, aside from the fact that they just jumped to the finals in between all of that. So uh, last surprise team, yep. the Clippers, similar case. You know, I think that they've done a decent job of bringing in floor raising depth. When it, you look at Derek Jones and Nick Batum and Chris Dunn and Zubots is still around and uh, Norman Powell is still around and everything else. But if Kawhi, has a Kawhi type of regular season where he is intermittently available and not consistently great, then you're talking about Harden chucking shots with a bunch of defenders around him. And even if even if those guys, you know, let's say they're like 18th in defense because of all that, or let's 15th, 14th, but their offense is just terrible and they're not, you know, really playing together much and their chemistry is bad and they lose close games a lot because of all that or whatever. Same kind of thing. They're not going to be the worst team in the league, but they could be 12th, 13th, and then just kind of say, yeah, Kawhi, you just, you know, go back to San Diego for March and April. We don't need this, and we'll take the high Kawhi pick. played... Uh, I don't think they have their pick, though. That's the problem, right? I don't think they actually have their pick, but that's uh, that's part of the situation. So Kawhi played 68 games last year. Uh, that sounds not like a lot. It's a lot for him. It's the first time where he's ever played more than 57 games in a Clippers uniform uh their first round pick is owed to oklahoma city in a swap but uh yep. for houston's first round pick protected yep. for selections one through ten so does that mean their pick is protected one through ten or the houston one is i'm a little confused um these picks with the thunder and the clippers and the nets and the suns and the rockets and all the it it's honestly like they don't have their pick. That's what I can say right. with i confidence. think it's the houston pick that's protected i'm not sure how that factors into the swap it's very confusing um so, but to your point, they might be bad by accident anyway. Uh, Kawhi Leonard, if he misses, if he misses twenty five games, right? It's like one thing to look at this roster with Kawhi Leonard and James Harden. It's a very different thing to say. All right, well now just figure that they're gonna, they're gonna have twenty five games without Kawhi. All right, they're not better. Let's count them off: the Thunder, the Nuggets, the Wolves, the Mavericks, the Suns. The Pelicans, the Lakers, the Kings, the Grizzlies. That's already nine teams that I would take over the Clippers. Yep. That's not including a team like the Warriors or the Rockets, who could be a little bit better, even the Spurs. So we could be looking at a team uh, in the Clippers that if things don't go right, they're one major injury or one sort of Kawhi not caring now that Paul George left or whatever it might be away from ending up in the lottery by accident. So you're right to put them in this tier. One mini take, this is not really a fully, you know, thing, but I just, I don't agree with the idea. Thank you. Yeah, a little one. Uh, I don't agree with the idea that there's this perception and the Nets just did it, which I feel like is just going to make it be reinforced more. It came up with the Hawks getting rid of Murray and everything where, well, you can't tank if you don't have your own picks. Right. Yes, you can. Because... Part of the value of tanking is not just to get one single high draft pick from being very bad one time. It's also to give yourself the opportunity to not, to clear your cap sheet, to not give your minutes to players who aren't going to get better and things like that. So that's part of why I still have the Clippers here. Yeah, they're not going to, they're not going to get Cooper flag. So I guess they might not belong in like this exact exercise, but I don't think it would be a bad thing if this season ended up with them getting rid of Norm Powell maybe getting rid of Ivica Zubats and, you know, at the very least bringing some younger talent in the door and starting to just look toward what the next version of this team might be. Even if it has Kawhi on it, frankly, if Paul George is gone, this group's not winning a title. So the idea that you're, it's only a successful kind of reset if you end up with the third overall pick or something. And if you're not able to have that, that you're just kind of like you, you're wasting your time. The Brooklyn Nets taught us the opposite of that. There's plenty of examples of teams that have been able to get back to having a real young core and looking like they have a future 
despite not having their picks or having lower picks because of swaps or whatever the case may be. So I just kind of, I think that because of all these big mega trades we've seen, teams are like, everybody's screwed unless they have their, that's just not going to play out that way. Like we got to get used to the idea that you, you're going to have to get creative. And I think the Clippers and you might can always one of those trade teams. your good players to your point for other teams picks too. It's not the same as tanking with your own picks, but it's also trading your good players for more first round picks. Maybe not the most effective way to tank, but also yeah. a version of doing it. Yeah, I think even before the Nets got their own player, their own picks back, they were in a yep. decent spot because they had all the Suns yep. picks and everything else. So, you know, you can you can do something with that. All right, biggest Olympics questions, macro view. There's three weeks before game start. We'll cover it in a real preview format with odds and who's going to win and all that stuff as we get closer. But we want to rosters are set, camps are starting. We know the stakes, we know the groups, we know all that. What do we have our eye on? We'll get to that next. First, Homage, an ultra-comfortable specialty apparel company providing support for today's show with NBA and WNBA licenses that uses vintage-inspired designs to pay homage to the greatest stories, traditions, and figures across sports, music, and pop culture. Use the link below, make a purchase, support the Just Basketball Show. Okay, Wes, I will kick us off. Actually, you have a Team USA question, so why don't you get us? Why don't you yeah, get us started? Yeah, I'm looking here. at our outline um, here. You, let's you, start uh, yeah, locally. Exactly. You got a bunch of other countries. We don't care about those other countries. It's USA, baby. Like, let's go. Who no. starts? We got the we got the new dream team coming back here, and it's a serious question about who is going to start for Team USA. And here's why I've landed on this. So this is part question, part take. So the question yeah. is, who starts? My and okay. and everything that I've seen. And all the reporting around it is, well, we know four of the starters for sure. Steph Curry, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, and Joel Embiid. Because we won, Team USA won the big Joel Embiid battle, right? We beat France and Cameroon and all these other teams. We got Joel Embiid, so now we have to start him. And I've seen that, and I get it. And I understand it from a political uh, point of view, why you have to start Embiid. But I'll get back to that here in a second. Put a pin in that for now. The question is, who's the fifth starter, right? And so... You can go in a few different directions with this. My t- uh, let's start with there, and then I'll get to my take. I think the fifth starter will probably be Anthony Davis. And I say that because you look at Team USA's group, and the first team they get to play... Are you, did you say the right last name there? <laughs> I'm agreeing with you on the first name. I don't know if we agree so on the second name. This is name. the part I wanted to get to, but put a pin in that. But I, I, I think what they'll ultimately end up doing is just starting AD... The first game they play is against Serbia. And you can make the argument that nobody does a better job guarding, or has more experience, I should say, guarding Nikola Jokic than Anthony Davis does in in playoff settings. And if you put Anthony Davis and Joel Embiid on the court, that's a lot of size in between Nikola Jokic and the basket. And that might be where they end up going. Also, when you look at uh, reasons why they might have to start with size first, France is big with Gobert and Victor Wembanyama. Greece is really big. Germany uh is 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 huge so there might be a reason for the team usa to trend bigger even though they're coached by steve kerr who does tend to want to go small push comes to shove but he's also never had a roster like this so that's my best i hear you it's gonna be fascinating i think the only reason that I might think not Anthony Davis from just treating it as a question about Anthony Davis for now, before we get into even the other options is I think he's probably the best backup center. So if he's starting, you're getting kind of messy with the rotation where he's probably the first sub out. And then he's the backup five when Embiid has to come out. And then it's like, how much can Embiid play? Don't you kind of want a little bit more fortification behind him? Uh, It also gets, yeah, you have Bam, okay. and that's where I was going to go. Like it, it, Part of what's going to be fascinating with this group is the introduction of Curry and LeBron being guys who don't recently have the kind of bandwidth or I guess uh, like track record with Team USA, but obviously very much do in literal USA basketball as in American basketball as in the NBA. That's going to be interesting, you know. Bam played when it was like, are we going to get sick and freaking cough mm-hmm. up a lung four years ago? And he went out there and won a gold, you know. And Tatum has been through this multiple times. And Devin Booker has. And uh, Tyrese played in the World Cup, whereas LeBron and Curry are just kind of here. Anthony Davis, another one who's just kind of there. So 
the the like loyalty and where it goes and who gets that first spot on the totem pole is interesting and i and obviously Embiid being he he's not really part of it cuz they needed him so badly but i think the center spot's an interesting example of it cuz i could see games where bam doesn't play at all and i could see games where bam closes because like all of a sudden he he is super important cuz Embiid's in foul trouble and he's just been more reliable than AD or something I, you know i could i could easily I could see, see it going anyway i could see games where Embiid doesn't play because we weren't even sure he was going to play because mm. of health reasons. Ditto for Kawhi Leonard. Is yeah. there going to be, yeah. when the USA is playing, and I mean no offense, but Puerto Rico, do you need Joel Embiid and Kawhi Leonard for that game? No, you don't. You don't need them for South Sudan. Sure. And it's, South Sudan, although yeah, they're big. But you but, shouldn't yeah. need them for that those games. So do you just bench those guys for portions yeah. of group play? I, I think you probably could get away with it. So, yeah. all right. So that's that was my best guess, I, and I have no idea. And that's for the record, not what I would do. Okay. So I think I Anthony Edwards you... starts. I think Anthony. So Edwards So you think starts. it'll be? And I and I would so start you think Anthony it'll be Edwards. Embiid, LeBron, KD, Steph, and Ant. Yeah, and I think one thing that this roster, and it feels like we say this every year, and I think it's one of the reasons actually that 2021 team kind of overperformed or, or was a little more steady than their talent would have indicated, although we're still going to have more talent than most teams, even with the kind of the B squad is they had shooting and uh, almost every year we end up saying this. That's why Carmelo Anthony became like a spot up God. Every time those extra, you know, whatever number of inches and then his kind of need to play that role, just turned him into like their best option to just bomb threes. And I don't know who does that on this roster. I don't know if Ant is necessarily suited to have to do that, Maybe it's just kind of ends up being Steph. I think Booker clearly can, Tatum clearly can, but from a starting lineup standpoint, I get the idea of going big, but you're clogging things up even more. I like to just say, hey, let's let's just do a lineup that physically looks more like a standard basketball lineup would look with roles that feel a little more normal and make teams beat us, frankly. Um yeah, I could see that. I also had like Drew Holiday penciled in and maybe Anthony Edwards' place just for yep. perimeter defense. And everybody loves Drew Holiday, and I could just see him winning over the coaches. Could definitely see him definitely. closing, if even um, if he doesn't start. I think That's I would sure. probably go, if, if, if it were up to me, I would go with Steph. My biggest problem with Anthony Edwards in the starting lineup is I don't know what his function is if he's playing with LeBron James and Steph. I feel like that should mostly be the offense is LeBron and Steph. And then Anthony Edwards can come in as a super six man where even if Devin Booker were to play with those guys, I think he would be a lot more comfortable being that elite shooter off the ball. Even a Drew Holiday, three and D kind of wing, Mm -hmm. Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum, those guys, I think it all just play off of LeBron and Steph. And I I don't know that Anthony Edwards is going to do that. Is Anthony Edwards, like he was already on the record saying I'm the number one option. He didn't do he that didn't at do the it, World and, Cup. And they needed it at all. That team became but, Ant Ball, and they needed it. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't like okay, Ant, we're gonna run something for Brunson real quick. Go stand in the right. corner like that. Right. Just didn't so, happen. Anthony Edwards is already telling reporters in Las Vegas, "I'm the number one option. And it's everybody else's job to work." Which I, was he kidding? I don't he know. Was kidding. I don't. I think this guy's or being facetious at least. I, I really think he believes this stuff, man, and I love it. I love Anthony Edwards for it. But what is the value of saying it, you know? Like, that's why I just assumed he must have been kind of tongue-in-cheek because it's like, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but, like, does anyone else agree with you? And then are you just going to piss people off? What's the (laughs) upside of making that claim? Um, More commercials. Um, I think, uh, but to your point, like, going into the World Cup last year, Anthony Edwards' projected role was sixth man off the bench. And then because they had zero scoring in the starting lineup, they had to elevate Anthony Edwards into the number one role. They're not going to need that this year, yeah. this this time around in the Olympics, because they're going to be able to score points without him on the court. Uh, so I do wonder whether or not yeah. they'll start him. I would go, if it were up to me, I would start Steph, Holiday, Durant. You know what? I'm even lying. I think I would start Tatum over Durant. I know you can't do it. It's what I would do. No. Durant is the Carmelo Diana Taurasi role at this point. <laughs> he's he's just he's been there for too long. It's You're not allowed it, to do it's it. Not happen, but it's but, what I would do if politics didn't matter. But either way, it doesn't it's, it's fair. not it's not that important. That's fine. And then LeBron, and then honestly, but I would start Anthony Davis over in Joel Embiid, I think. And I know again you can't do it because you won the Joel Embiid mm-hmm. sweepstakes. 
But I, I, I just trust Anthony Davis a little bit more at this stage, which is saying, which is crazy. But considering again that I wasn't even sure Embiid was going to show up, so there might be games where I'm without Embiid. I don't want to be toggling my starting lineup every other game, depending on whether or not Embiid can play. Where Anthony Davis is coming off of a really healthy season, he's going to be able to play. It, honestly, round of applause for AD graduating out of the injury concern group in the NBA. He had one great healthy season, and it's just like AD's not an injury risk anymore. Let's put him. If you really in wanted the, the Iron Man you know, out there, we put Bam. In Thirty-five minutes put Bam starting out there, center. who could just who doesn't even it's need true. the ball. That's true. At yeah. least he got on the team. He he deserved it. Um, yeah. I, uh, I one last little thought on the lineup and rotation. Not positive. Steph will close mm-hmm. every game, given how physical. Team USA can be and just the fact that he we haven't seen him not play curveball in a decade right. you know it's like what does that look like what, what does he even do in a in a team that's not built the way that the Warriors are I mean it's going to be fun to watch but if it doesn't go perfectly and he's getting kind of overmatched defensively then maybe a lot of this looks a lot different okay my first question, we're going to talk NBA guys, but it is, it is different countries. How much does Victor Wembanyama mm. play? As a starting point, we could go way bigger in scope than that, obviously. But he is the young guy around. They're, they're starting to kind of phase in, like Koulibaly is on this team as well. Uh, but you're still seeing like a Gershon Yabusele and, and, and Evan Fournier and whatnot. But he is still like kind of starting his international career. He didn't play at the World Cup last year. And they're a really good program. You know, he obviously has a lot of admiration for Rudy Gobert. This team's always a factor in these tournaments. And so I would imagine he'll start at the four. I'm not saying that he's going to be some sort of bench warmer, but how much does he play and how much is he featured? There's a version of this tournament where Victor Wimbanyama is comes out of it looking like watch the <laughs> fuck out. <laughs> and there's a version where he's just kind of a role player playing defense, knocking down threes, doing his job and France gets eliminated in like the bronze medal game because they just kind of do their thing and and he's just a part of it. I probably lean more toward the first than the than the latter, but it's an interesting question yeah. to consider because of the history with that with that uh, country. Well, we're already seeing Victor Wembanyama and Rudy Gobert run pick and roll with each other, so we've got that going. And I don't know that there is a version where he's just yeah. a role player, only because of what he's able to do defensively is going to be so terrifying for every other team. France is really good; like they have the third best odds on BetMGM to win this thing, behind USA and Canada. And Every indication we've gotten from Victor Wembanyama is this is really important to him. He takes his uh, French, um, you know, background very seriously. He represents Paris. He represents France in a very serious way. And he's been talking about this for a very long time. These Olympics for a very long time. I think they're gonna have to drag him off the court. He's only really been playing like twenty minutes uh, in the in in the qualifiers. But as these games get more and more serious. Um, I think he's going to get more and more serious. So I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just all in just drinking the Webinyama Kool-Aid here, but he's got every, re- and the guy's young, man. Like he's got every reason to take this seriously. Yeah. So I think we'll get a big, a big summer from him. I'm absolutely yeah. in agreement. I just wanted That's to pose question. a question. I think Vic is going to dominate. I think that he is absolutely too good to be kept off the court. And frankly, you know, Nando DiColo and Evan Fournier, like they are only going to do this for, for so long. And, and Nicholas Batum, right? Like they didn't play, they didn't perform as well in the world cup as we're accustomed to seeing. They got eliminated fairly early and they might just need Vic as like a shot creator. Like you said, running pick and roll and whatnot and, and posting up and doing his thing as a scorer. Like I, I just, you don't bring that guy along and he's like the, the royalty of, of France. And then, not take advantage right. when push comes to shove and you're being tested in a game and it's knockout round and you're down six and you have that guy on the court and you just tell him you to go play a role. So I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Kind of along the same lines, this is a, a fun one. 
and and you might have different thoughts on it than me. Who is the surprise standout player? Now, in previous years, and I actually put this one of these guys on my list, so I'll take him off. It was Lowry Markkinen with Finland using the World Cup as a jumping or Euro basket. It might have been as a jumping off point for what kind of spurred his uh, breakout with the Jazz in 2022-23. Rui Hachimura kind of turned his career around playing with the international team and getting to be the guy and that, you know, he took some mental health time the following season, then gets traded to the Lakers, and he's been a, a solid player ever since. This happens. It also, of course, happens with Team USA, as we saw kind of with Ant showing us what he was about to do on a bigger stage or Brandon Ingram going the other direction, but let's keep it positive. Um, so the candidates that I have on my list right now are Dyson Daniels, Bilal Koulibaly, Nikola Jovic, Tyrese Halliburton. Like, does some, does something happen where all of a sudden he like is is getting minutes when we don't really expect him to on Team USA? And Bull Bull, who is with South Sudan, did not play in the World Cup last year. Had a pretty solid regular season in the NBA. Is probably one of the more you know higher pedigree guys on that South Sudan team if he can get minutes and stay healthy and everything else. So those are my five. Do you have another one? Do you like one of those? Uh, Who is going to be the next? Oh, wow. That's a guy now. I think we're already kind of there maybe with this guy, but Andrew Nemhard on Canada. I could see him mm. playing an important role for that yeah, team. I like that. Um, that w- Proving that the playoffs right, right, were exactly. real. Sort of sort like of that thing. was sort of where it yeah. started, and then he sort of solidifies his leap in the Olympics, and then he's a big deal for the Pacers next year. That was the only other name I had. I like that one. Yeah, I, Rui was Rui could do it right. again, but you know he got his bag already and everything else. Uh, I'm 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 interested. I'm going to be watching a lot of these younger guys just to kind of see. You could even say Santi Aldama. That's kind of a deep cut, but he played really well in the World yes. Cup and had an awesome regular season. And in Memphis, Memphis. looks like be a good real rotation again guy for them year, now. So people will be paying attention to him, which helps yeah. is like sort of the wind in the sails part. I'm glad you wrote down Nikola Jovic, though. Yeah, he's a real part of that Spanish team. I think team, Nikola though. Jovic for yeah. Serbia is in for a big season. I don't or a big a big olympic he basically began his leap last year with miami where he started out of the rotation to start the season and then was starting playoff games by design not just because of all the injuries they had he was actually their starting power forward by the time the playoffs came around uh he started that leap last year in the world cup with a really impressive appearance uh showing for serbia he's he's been talking all year again i'm here locally covering the miami heat He's talked all year about wanting, uh, looking forward to playing for the Olympics. And so he's really excited that he was able to qualify for the roster and all these things. Uh, and he's really into this whole experience. So I could see him having a big experience. All right. Last question from you. What do you got? Oh, that's all. That's all I had. Okay. Okay. I have, uh, I'll, I'll let you answer whichever one you think is most interesting. Either. What does the Shea Gildas Alexander Jamal Murray partnership look like with Team Canada, which we did not see at the World Cup. No Andrew Wiggins, so it's really those two guys. And Canada did, did need more offense. Shea was a little overburdened doing it all. Dylan Brooks decided to be, you know, prime Michael Jordan in his imagination on that team last year. Now it's Murray. What does Murray look like? Kind of away from Jokic. There's a lot there. And then the other one, Josh Giddy. Australia was not great in the World Cup. He was not. He was good, but not great. Another kind of established program. Can he take the kind of baton from Patty Mills and all that and and show, hey, you know, Ben Simmons never panned out here, but like, I'll be that. Especially after the move away from OKC, he probably has kind of a fire under him to go prove I'm I'm really a guy. Um, so what does he look like with, with something real to prove? Which one of those interests you most and what's your answer? Uh, to the well, you already explained the giddy part of it. That's not even that interesting to me. So it's the SGA Jamal Murray part that, that to me is really interesting. First of all, group a Australia, Greece, Canada, You're the biggest Spain. Josh giddy guy on of the three of us. He, I, I mean, I was giving you bait there. You, you could have talked, but I also guy. don't know that I'm like, wait, Australia's playing at 10 30 AM on a Tuesday. I got to make sure I'm tuning into that, clearing my schedule. Like I'm, I don't know that I'm going to be doing that. But uh, okay. I right. do, I am interested in the SGA Jamal Murray part of it because Canada is clearly taking sort of another leap here, right? They actually kind of got screwed based on their global standing, and that's why they're in Group A. So they got a tough group here, but they're sort of coming on. They've got Dylan Brooks as a part of it. Kelly Linux still a part of that team and everything like that. Uh, Lou Dort, SGA's teammate in Oklahoma City, 
a part of Team Canada. But SGA and Jamal Murray, that those are the stars of that team. I don't think it's going to be that much different from Jamal Murray. Uh, it's going to be different, obviously, because only there's only one Jokic. But SGA is still a guy who basically operates in the middle of the floor, in the paint, and kicks out the shooters and gets guys involved. And I think Jamal Murray will thrive with that. I don't know that SGA has ever played. Shea has never played with somebody like Jamal Murray, who is that kind of perimeter threat, right? As good as Jalen Williams is, or even like an Isaiah Joe. Like Isaiah Joe doesn't have the off the dribble game that Jamal Murray has, and and Jalen Williams doesn't have the perimeter shooting that Jamal Murray has. I think Shea is really going to enjoy playing with Jamal Murray. I think that tandem is going to click. I think it's going to click very quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think both of those guys are going to feed off of each other too emotionally. Shea. The more understated guy, kind of just punch in, punch out, lunch pail kind of guy, do the work. Jamal Murray, a lot more fiery. I could see him being almost the emotional leader of that team, where SGA is the actual leader, leader on the sure. court of that team. I think they'll, I think they'll function well together. I just uh, will say I don't. I would have no interest as an opposing <laughs> team being in a close game with that group. No, 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 yep. no interest uh, between Murray and, and Gilgis Alexander, two of the most clutch guards in the entire NBA. Uh, I just, you know, I, I agree. Like Murray, it's not like he's some f- fake, crazy basketball player that only exists next to Jam- Nikola Jokic, and we can't imagine it in any other context. However, I guess I just hope it doesn't become kind of like your turn, my turn stuff between the two of them. You know, I, I just want it to be a little prettier. I want that for Shea. Cause like you said, he's never played with mm-hmm. anybody like this. And OKC's team last year was very your turn, yeah. my turn. And I would just like, you know, with the, the passing bigs they have and everything else, like there is, there, there is a lot of meat on the bone, but that's, what's so fun about kind of international basketball is these teams just have a month to develop all this chemistry and like emotional connection and kind of, you know, mind reading that they're going to need to do to win. And they don't actually, you know, ever actually have that much time to do it. And it's Murray's first go round with all this. So that one will be fun. All right. I think that's good. Uh, back Friday, Chris and I previewing summer league, most likely looking ahead to, uh, well, looking back at any moves that have happened, looking ahead to uh, more Olympic stuff. It is that time of year, but there's a ton of basketball going on. So don't go anywhere. Hit follow, subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll be back on Friday.